doing ex you're good at doing extemporaneous. So would you please do our opening prayer for us? The Lord be with you. And also, and also with, with you. you. Lord, we thank you for the chance to meet together, the opportunity to meet together today, 316. We thank you for Barbara, who will be leading us in this lesson. Guide her as she gives us the words that you want us to hear and open our hearts that we may receive the words that you want us to hear. We ask for your blessing on all those who are suffering, Lord. We especially think of those in the Ukraine. We thank you for the countries that are taking in the refugees who are giving them the help they need. Walk with us all today, Lord, as we know you do, that what we do and say may be to your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Thank you, Mommy. Nice. Thank Very you. Good. Thank you. Okay. Uh, chapter three, we finally got there, okay? Uh, just remember that what Paul is saying, uh, he introduced himself in the beginning of the epistle as an apostle, which means he's not only spreading the good word, the good news, he is commissioned by God to do so. So now we've gone to chapter three. Uh, the beginning of this chapter has Paul questioning the actions of the Galatians because they're ignoring the fact that they were baptized into the new covenant by the spirit. They instead regress to the law. They have forgotten or ignored the fact that Jesus redeemed the world through his sacrifice to the Father, which was on behalf of humankind, whether they are Christians or they are Gentiles. The fruits of this sacrifice enable us to be united with God as our sins are forgiven. This gift is given to us by the grace of God and is received by us through our response of faith. Uh, Deborah, would you please read that uh, section? Certainly. Is, uh, 15 through 18 in Galatians. And I'm reading from the NIV translation. <laughs> Brothers, let me take an example from everyday life. Just as no one can set aside or add to a human covenant that has been du duly established, so it is the case here. The promises were spoken to Abraham and to his seed. The scripture does not say, and to seeds, meaning many people, but, and to your seed, meaning one person who is Christ. What I mean is this, the law introduced 430 years later does not set aside the covenant previously established by God and thus do away with the promise. For if the inheritance depends on the law, then it no longer depends on a promise. But God in his grace gave it to Abraham through a promise. Thank you. Okay, this is the crux of this whole uh, section and letter to Galatians. This is kind of where it's at, so to speak. Um, here are some words that We've read before, I'm sure. Uh, I don't remember when. But in these verses, uh, I never, ever picked up on the fact that when God promised <clears throat> salvation to humankind, to Abraham, okay, he used the singular of the word seed rather than the plural. And I always... I don't know, maybe you all are brighter than me, but I always thought that meant all the descendants of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, yada, 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 okay? No, that's not the theological interpretation. The interpretation is that it is one seed, and that seed is Jesus Christ. So that totally reverses something that I used to believe in. I believe that, okay, we are considered the seeds of Abraham, even though we are not uh, born as Jewish people, okay? So I just assume that, okay, so salvation comes to me 
to Abraham, right? Wrong. The salvation comes through one, and that is Jesus Christ. He is the culmination of everything. Okay? Abraham was promised that his seed would be saved. Okay? But remember, this was, as we just heard, 430 years before the law. So for those who lived between the covenant God made with Abraham and Moses receiving the law, there was no law from God. Okay? So this tells us right away, if we had to be redeemed by adhering to the law, we got an awful lot of people who, inherit, who lived on the earth who would not be eligible for salvation because there was that gap from Abraham's promise to Moses getting the law. And that is something that totally escaped me. All right. So we will get back to what good the law does, but obviously our redemption, our salvation, the removal of the guilt of sin cannot depend on the law because it didn't even exist when that was made okay so the words that paul speaks he says right off the bat i speak in the manner of men paul first establishes the principle that even the covenant among men a covenant st should stand firm once it's made and remember in the old days, and now I'm talking ancient days, okay? Uh, people made promises and covenants with a handshake. They didn't have lawyers. They didn't have the county courthouse to file, okay? So it was strictly a one-on-one, -on -one, okay? I established this covenant with you. So this is between, at the time, God and Abraham. It is believed in a covenant. We've, we've gone over this in Deuteronomy, but it's been a while. With a covenant, no one can add to it or take away from it. It is when, when God makes a covenant, it is what it is. Okay. Paul's point isn't really about covenants among men, but to say, how much more is a covenant that God makes? As difficult and as dangerous as Paul's opponents in Galatia were, they were his brothers. So when he talks to them, he refers to them as brothers. And we all know it's much better. He starts out saying, brethren, I speak in the manner of men. Okay, isn't it much easier and, and more profitable if we need to discuss something with someone that's kind of antagonistic that you kind of try to establish a truth or a peace to start with. It puts everybody in a much better frame of mind. Okay. So this is what Paul's trying to do. He's angry with these Galatians because they're slipping away in the wrong direction. Okay. But he doesn't attack them. All right. He comes on as a friend, brethren. Okay, because he knew these people. Okay, from the uh, verses, now to Abraham and his seed were the promises made. Okay, we need to go back to Genesis. I have Kim, is Kim Bowers here? Okay, then somebody needs to, uh, I'm sorry, I, I have these assigned. I didn't, wasn't aware she wouldn't be here. I need someone to read Genesis. Chapter 22, verse 18. And through your offspring, all nations on earth will be blessed because you have obeyed me. Okay. He's making this promise. Read that again, please. And through your offspring, 
all nations on earth will be blessed because you have obeyed me. Okay, this is God talking to Abraham 400 plus years before the law came. He is promising salvation, okay? Yes. It almost seemed impossible at the time because Abraham uh, didn't have his child. But Abraham was a man of faith. And if God said this to him, he probably at the time had no clue how this is going to occur, but he had faith and he believed what God had said. So God promised Abraham that in his seed, singular, so who's the seed? Jesus. Jesus, Jesus Christ. Jesus. Right. Okay. In your seed, all the nations of the earth shall be blessed. This is saying that this blessedness and salvation will occur not immediately, okay, not in a hundred years, okay, but when Jesus fulfills his role as coming to earth, Paul observes that the singular for seed is used, not the plural. The point is clear, and to your seed, who is Christ. God is referring to one specific descendant of Abraham, not to his descendants in general. Quote, for if the inheritance is of the law, it is no longer of promise, but God gave it to Abraham by promise. If the inheritance offered to Abraham had been on the basis of the law, it might not be permanent because it would depend, at least in part, on Abraham's keeping the law. But since the inheritance was offered on the basis of promise, God's promise, it stands sure. And we, again, we can go back to our study of Deuteronomy. Okay? There's a little if. It, it, he doesn't say if. But we've talked at length. I know Marlene brought this up many times. If there's an if, okay, it's dependent on something. All right. Uh, you know, I will, I will love you if you love me back. Okay. I will save you if you do what I say. There's that little if. So even though God made this, made this talk to. Uh, Abraham uh, regarding law it, it, it was dependent all right but no God didn't say that if all right if you adhere to law which we don't even have yet all right he promised Abraham promised that is totally holy completely uh, where God said this will happen, it will happen. He's not going to go back on it. There's no if there. Okay? Therefore, Christ, who is God, who is the son of God, okay, he was promised to come to this earth to redeem mankind. So there's a big difference here between Abraham being told to adhere to a law than to being totally dependent on Jesus Christ. Do we have anything to do in our will that affects what Jesus Christ did? <clears throat> no. Okay. That promise was totally dependent on Jesus Christ. Not that we had nothing to do with it. Barbara? Absolutely. Yes. Um, I might argue with that that it is because of our sin Christ died for us yes. so we have a lot to do with it in that regard the reason for the promise having to be made yeah okay but at this point in time uh there's nothing we can do to uh to grant salvation yeah. it's got to be Jesus Christ which <laughs> We're jumping ahead a little bit, but which means we 
have to accept that promise, what it means, what its results are in the sacrifice of Christ by faith. This is kind of our point in this, okay? We, we have to believe, and this is what separates good works from faith. Uh, okay, so God gave this to Abraham by promise. There's a little word in there that has a lot of meaning. The word gave is based on the Greek word paris, which means grace. So God's giving to Abraham was the free giving of grace. It was a gift. It is a gift. Now, just a little comparison. The Jewish Christians would probably quote Moses in their arguments for uh, adhering to the law uh, and, and where it fits in with following Jesus Christ. But Paul will go back way farther and he will quote Abraham. Let the Jewish Christians quote the law. Paul will quote the promise. If they appeal to the centuries of tradition and the proud history of the law of Moses, then Paul will appeal to the grander covenant with Abraham, which was older by centuries still. So now you see there's Paul is, is doing this argument that, you know, don't depend on this law of Moses. It wasn't even there when this whole sequence of events started. But it's here now. Okay. So the next little section uh, is the purpose of the law, which helps us to understand our freedom from the law. Now, that sounds kind of like a contradiction. Okay. But it really isn't. Okay. Um, Paul says in verses uh, 19, oh, uh, yeah. The law was given because of man's transgression. The promises of God? Certainly not. For if there had been a law given which could give life, true righteousness would have been by the law. First, what purpose does the law serve? It was added because of our transgressions. Laura, what you said. Okay? It was the law came because man sinned. Okay. Part, okay. Uh, I've got you reading the next section, Laura. Where are we there, Barbara? I joined late. I'm sorry. Okay. Uh, read verses 23, verses 20. I'm sorry, verses 19 through 24. In which chapter? Three. Okay. It's the one I signed like two weeks ago. What then was the purpose of the law? It was added because of transgressions until the seed to whom the promise referred had come. The law was put into effect through angels by a mediator. A mediator, however, does not represent just one party, but God is one. Is the law therefore opposed to the promises of God? Absolutely not. For if a law had been given that could impart life, then righteousness would certainly have come by the law. But the scripture declares that the whole world is a prisoner of sin, so that what was promised, being given through faith in Jesus Christ, might be given to those who believe. Before this faith came, we were held prisoners by the law, locked up until faith should be revealed. Thank you. Okay, uh, Kathy, I've got you down to read the next section, Romans. Mm -hmm. Yes, Seven. this is from NIV. Okay. For when we were in the realm of the flesh, the sinful passions aroused by the law were at work in us so that we bore fruit for death. But now by dying to what was once to what once bound us, we have been released from the law so that we serve in the new way of the spirit and not in the old way of the written code. What shall we say then? Is the law sinful? Certainly not. 
Nevertheless, I would not have known what sin was had if it had not been for the law, for I would not have known what coveting really was if the law had not said, you shall not covet. But sin, seizing the opportunity at, afforded by the commandment, produced in me every kind of coveting. For apart from the law, sin was dead. Once I was alive apart from the law, but when the commandment came, sin sprang to life and I died. Okay, uh, God is very, I, I, I'm going to use the word intelligent. We know he's everything, okay? But he knew that once man gave into his flesh rather than the spirit, which Adam did, and man had been doing ever since, okay? Once they gave into the flesh, he had to set some kind of a standard he had to set these laws and there's a comment uh, somewhere in my stuff which says God found it necessary to give us the law because if he didn't give us the law we would probably have been annihilated. We would have killed off all on our own. We would have killed off the human race. We may have had a little influence by Satan, by the devil, the tempter, okay? But, I mean, just think of it. In a lawless society, everything's just amok, okay? And it's the not only the survivors of the fittest, but the cleverest, the strongest, the whatever. So it, we have a horrible state in the world right now. But it would be far worse if we didn't have some laws to abide by. Okay? And so God saw what mankind was doing, and he thought... Well, if they're going to survive as a race, you know, we, we've lost some uh, animals and things like that because uh, there are no, I mean, they just run rampant and kill one another or mankind kills them or whatever. This could have happened to man. So he set some standards and God in his wisdom, that's the word I should have used. If God in his wisdom, he decided that there needs to be standards. And to give a very back-to-earth home example, those of us who have raised children know you've got to give your kids discipline, okay? If, if you don't tell that child, don't run out in the street and say, because you might get hit by a car, we're laying down standards. I cooked on the top of that stove. Don't touch it. It's going to be hot. And you're going to be burned. Okay? So discipline. Uh, to me, the law initially was more discipline than not. But if you look at the law, uh, it was to save mankind. Okay? And God realized that he could not hold man accountable for his sins, if man didn't know that was sin. Man had to know he was sinning. And I think the majority of us have very little difficulty in knowing and understanding when we commit a sin. I was wrong, I messed up. There's very few of us who do something against the laws of God that aren't aware of what we are doing. Now, we may justify it in our own mind. Well, I had to do that because yada, 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 okay? But nevertheless, we know when we sin. We have that inborn in us. That's the law. And that, so the purpose of the law, when God gave the law to Moses, was for a good reason. It was to let these people know as they're crossing this desert, and going to establish their own community, their own nation, okay? What they should or shouldn't do that's in line with what God wants. And if you look at, I'm not talking about the laws that got magnified beyond what they should have been. We all know in our own country, we started out, you know, with the Constitution and the amendments to the Constitution, okay? They were written on paper, probably a good deal of paper, but nothing compared 
through the law library of what interpretation has come into the law. And if you've got a good lawyer, he can twist it around to mean anything. So we're not talking about that end of the law. We're talking about basically the Ten Commandments. Okay, and they really are, if you think about it, written in the hearts of man. And this is where Abraham's coming from. Abraham knew instinctively what was the right thing to do and what was the wrong thing to do, all right? And so God chose well when he chose Abraham. And if you look at the Ten Commandments, that really is our law. That is what we, that is what we do or don't do, depending on if it's a thou shalt or thou shalt not. Okay, and that's written in our heart. Any questions or discussion on that? Do you follow where I'm going? Okay. So, so these laws were given to... Sorry, uh, uh, yes. Barbara, sorry. Kathy had her hand up. Oh, I'm sorry. That's okay. I was just going to say, uh, God says, if we repent of our sins, then we are saved too. And so if there's not law, then we can't repent. That's right. Exactly. We don't know what we did wrong. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Exactly. Uh, I've looked at my grandchildren sometimes and they look at me like, what are you talking about? Well, this is what, where you messed up. And we discipline them. Uh, we discipline them. Uh, but if we, uh, yeah, I know a family who, uh, she's from some weird sect in, in South America. Gorgeous girl, beautiful, lovely, intelligent. But she and her husband, who I knew as a child, they don't believe in disciplining their children and it's horrible they're you know his mother who's a very dear friend she will not let them come to the house anymore because they just run around i mean they just they're distressed if they decide to fight one another she lets them have at it if i did that with my two older boys they'd both be dead because they would have killed each other i mean you've got to have you, you've got to establish that that norm and that standard otherwise society would be Terrible. I will say though, at the same time, uh, with Moses and uh, you know the ancients, there were laws. Okay, uh, the world wasn't at that point running amok, but they were more civil laws than they were uh, religious. They weren't moral. Okay, they. Uh, you've all heard of the Code of Hammurabi, one of the first written accounts of of law. I couldn't tell you what century that was. But nevertheless, they realized that you can't run a country unless you have some laws, okay? And obviously in this time, yes, Marlene? You're on mute. Mute. Um, yeah, Barbara, finish what you were going to say and then I'd like to make a comment. No, that's okay, go ahead. Oh, I was gonna say, you had referred to something earlier uh -huh. about, uh, and mentioned it, almost in passing, I'll say, handshake. Yeah. Um, people back in the times that Barbara's talking about, the majority of them could not read or write. They could not afford attorneys. They didn't have attorneys and all that. Things were sealed with a handshake. And that was a bond that the people kept. I remember talking, gosh, this would have been early 80s to an oil man who had been in the basins in Texas and Oklahoma in the 20s and 30s. And he was telling me, and obviously it made an impression because I remember it all these years. He said, back in those days in the oil field, a lot of the men could not read or write. You know, they'd come out of World War One. They were, schools were not everything that we have now. But he, he made the comment that things were done on a handshake in those oil fields. And he said he never once saw those handshakes broken. Right. It, when you touch the flesh like that, if you're sincere, it, it sticks with you. Yeah, yeah. Very good. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so the law 
was meant to prepare us for the work of the Messiah. Uh, it was given till the seed, Jesus, should come. It isn't the law of Moses. It, it isn't that the law of Moses is revoked. There's st we still have the Ten Commandments as Christians, okay? So when Jesus came, Jesus said that he came to fulfill the law, not destroy it. Jim, would, uh, Kim, would you please read uh, Matthew 5, 17? Do I've not think. Go ahead. Sorry. Do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. Okay. Uh, we hear that throughout. And I have to admit, I never really fully understood that till I kind of went through some of this. So he's saying, God, or Paul is saying, that in, instead the law of Moses is no longer our ground of approaching God. And, and we'll go into that a little later. Okay. In the reading we had a little earlier, it said it was appointed, the law, through angels by the hand of a mediator. Now he means the law. So the law, according to ancient traditions, which are the traditions that Paul is talking about, the law was delivered to Moses on Mount Sinai by the hands of angels. Angels were the go-between. They were the mediator uh, between Moses and God when he received the law from God. I don't know how many of you have ever been in a legal mediation. Uh, when I worked at the dealership, uh, I, I got involved in a case where uh, they required that we go to a mediator first. Okay, which turned, that's another story. That turned out to be a big joke. But anyway, uh, when that didn't work, then we had to go to court. Okay, but uh, a lot, most uh, suits within work, uh, the work environment have to go through a mediator first. And sometimes the people are open to what the mediator is talking about and others say, no, I want to go to court. I want my money. And I'm happy to say this person lost the case. She was really off the mark. So she had to pay for our lawyer, her lawyer, and didn't get her money. But it was just, you know, some people don't listen. Okay. But now a mediator does not mediate for one only. Remember, they mediate between two people. Okay. Or entities of some kind. All right. Moses needed a mediator between himself and God. We do not, I repeat, we do not need a mediator between us and Jesus. He is our mediator. And this is where we get that he is the one who fulfilled the law. He did not commit a transgression. He never went against anything taught out of the Ten Commandments. The Jewish people the ones who were trying to trap him, on the other hand, considered that he did go against the law. Can anyone give me an example? How did the Pharisees attack? Uh, yes. Laura, you're on mute. To say, um, the law actually stood between say, Barbara and God, uh, because you had to go through the law. Well, Jesus broke the law because he went directly to Jesus, uh, to God. God, yes. yes. Uh, Laura had Laura. her hand up. Um, well, according to the Pharisees, he broke the law by uh, doing miracles on the Sabbath. Exactly, exactly. Mm -hmm. So, uh, but that did not come out. They extrapolated from keep holy the Lord's day to make, make that a law. Okay. But that's not the law that came from God. All right. They, they're just adding to it. You know, I don't mean to insult people who have been married to lawyers or are lawyers or anything else, but we know how messed up the system can get. I've known, I've known several men and women in my time who are incredible people and good lawyers. I've also known some Charlton. So <laughs> uh, unfortunately, 
that's an example where it's very obvious, okay? So Moses needed a mediator between himself and God, but we don't need a mediator between us and Jesus because he is our mediator. The law was a two-party agreement, okay, uh, brought by mediators. Salvation in Jesus is received by a promise. One commentator says that this verse 320 in Galatians is probably the most obscure verse in Galatians, if not the entire New Testament. The general thought seems to be that the promise must be considered superior to the law because the law is two-sided. The law was mediated. This means that man was a party to it, meaning that the fulfillment or the, the doing the law or not doing the law didn't depend on God. God established it. It was there. It was permanent. All right. But man is the one who had to say, I will adhere to this or I will sin. So, so man could monkey with this business. All right. The promise from God, on the other hand, was unilateral. Man is not a party to it. So, God said, this holds true until the seed comes. All right, there's no if there. It wasn't the law holds it if the seed comes. All right, God knew Jesus Christ was coming to earth to give his life for mankind, the guilt of sin, all that string of things, okay? So there was no iffy in here. This, this held fast. Is the law against the promises of God? Certainly not. The law is not something evil opposing God's promise. The problem with the law is found in its inability to give those who desire to keep it the strength. The law of Moses brings no life. It simply states the commandment. It tells us to keep it, and it tells us what the consequences are if we break the command. Martin Luther said, foolish, people foolish but wise in their own conceit, jump to the conclusion that if the law does not justify, it's good for nothing. How, how about that? Because money does not justify, would you say that money is good for nothing? Because the eye does not justify, would you have them take it out? Because the law does not justify, it does not follow that the law is without value. When the law drives you to the point of despair, let it drive you a little further. Let it drive you straight into the arms of Jesus. Because Jesus said, come unto me, all you that labor and are heavy burdened, and I will give you rest. Because many of us, myself included, struggle. The temptation of sin is there. We want to give into it. Okay, if we didn't have the law and we didn't have faith in Jesus, chances are we would go out and commit that sin. But when we call on our faith and believe that Jesus Christ died to save us from sin, to give us salvation, to let us return to heaven, to the home of God, Okay, that's a good thing. And we, we need that faith. And so it is so different to say, oh, I don't think Jesus really meant to do that. Or there's all those other people. I'm going to go out and commit my sin. But it should stop us from committing that sin because we're still going to add to the burden that Jesus carried on this earth when he carried the cross. Given to those who believe, only faith can break us out of our confinement to sin. The law of Moses can show us clearly our problems and God's standards beyond, okay? But it cannot give us the freedom that only Jesus can give. The freedom is given to those who believe. So we go back to a quick statement I made earlier, okay? God promised the Messiah, the seed, 
to mankind when he appeared to Abraham and had this initial promise, covenant made between God and Abraham. All right. So the Messiah has been promised. All right. The Messiah comes. The Messiah does his public work. And then he dies on the cross. There is some wonderful literature on exactly what he went through, what he meant when he gave his life on the cross. Okay. And God gives, gives, gives. We don't earn. He gives by grace. Okay, that justification that Jesus gave up to the Father. There's only one thing we have to do. And you trying to tell me what we have to do to receive that grace, that gift, that salvation. Repent and believe. Repent and believe. believe. All you have to do is have faith that God did that for you god accepted that for you it's nothing else that we do it's not our good deeds it's not our uh, uh you know going to church on sundays okay it's the fact that we repent what we did and that we believe that jesus christ did save us okay we're almost at the end uh the law of moses is our tutor going back to the law it's a guardian to bring us to jesus uh, JoLynn was going to do that. She's not here today. Uh, this is chapter 3, verses 23 to 25. But before faith came, we were kept under guard by the law, kept for the faith, which would afterward be revealed. Therefore, the law was our tutor to bring us to Christ, that we might be justified by faith. But after faith has come, we are no longer under a tutor. The whole purpose of the law is to bring us to Jesus. Therefore, if someone doesn't present the law in a manner that brings people to faith in Jesus, they aren't presenting the law properly. The way Jesus presented the law was to show people they could not fulfill it and needed to look outside of their law giving, law keeping, to find a righteousness greater than what the scribes and Pharisees we're preaching okay so again the law was simply a god that eventually leads us to jesus okay and this is where jesus is the fulfillment of that law when we give our faith in jesus christ as our savior okay we become one with christ we know we are all familiar with the body of christ as Christians, we are baptized into that body. We're all one. And you know what the old saying goes, if one part of you hurts, the whole body hurts. So we are united. We are one in Christ. Christ is the head. We are in that body of Christ. We are part of that body of Christ. Christ gave us life, no matter how well we obey the law, we're not going to live forever. Our, our priest the other day made the comment, uh, you know, they took a, the insurance company came out with a, a result of their study over many years. And it is that the mortality rate is 100%. So we are all going to die to this earthly life, all right? So no matter how we keep the law, we're going to die. But if we have the faith in Jesus Christ, we live. We know there's life beyond. We know those who have gone before us are there in the life beyond. So Christ gives us life. The law cannot give us life. There, And this goes back, this is also quoted in Romans. There is neither Greek nor Jew. There is neither slave nor free. There is neither male nor female. For you are all one in Jesus. If you are Christ, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. 
And to me, there is very little in the Bible that gives more hope and strength and comfort than this. I had an interesting comment yesterday. Uh, I, I went to a new doctor. He's been Jim's doctor for years. And he's a talker. <laughs> and, and we, we uh, uh, you know, brought up the fact uh, that we were Christian. Uh, and that kind of, oh, gosh, what's the point? Oh, and it came out that uh, we were talking about an old soul. And I brought up the fact that my grandson, Noah, a lot of you know, is an old soul. And uh, I said, we have this adopted grandson. I said, you know, I said, we don't know what race he is. He's, you know, uh, he wouldn't be considered Caucasian, but good Lord knows what's in there. And he, my doctor looked at me and he said, he's human. And I thought, wow, that kind of takes this whole, what this says, doesn't matter if you're Greek or Jew, slave or free, male or female, you're human. And this is who... Christ came to save humanity, the human being. And if we are Christ, the issue is not, are you under the law? Are you a Jew? Are you a Gentile? Are you free or slave? Are you a man or woman? The only issue is if you are Christ. If we are Christ, we find our place in eternity because we are sons and daughters of God. We find our place in society because we are brothers and sisters in the family of God. We find our place in history because we are God, part of God's plan of the ages. We are related spiritually to Abraham by our faith in Jesus. So just think of what that commitment does for you and I as human beings. It puts us all right out there. We're all together in this. Uh, you, of, you know and have heard we are the adopted children of God. So we're all one family. We are believers. That Just that one profession of faith, it gives us the world. It gives us everything. Okay, and we are, we talk about reading the threads in the Bible. One thing leads to another to another. Well, we are that way. If we want to do our family tree in God, all of those who are believers are on that tree together. A lot of good fruit there. Okay, so that I know I'm preaching to the choir, but it's that faith in Jesus Christ that makes us who we are, what we are, where we are going. And, you know, God willing, we're all going to show up there together. And I'm hoping we all live in the same neighborhood so we can keep in touch. <laughs> and, uh, but it is just so, it's such an important, uh, important part. It enables us to answer the most basic of all human questions. Who am I? And to say, in Christ, I am a son of God. In Christ, I am united to all the redeemed people of God, past, present, and future. In Christ, I discover my identity. In Christ, I find my feet. In Christ, I come home. Amen. Thank you very much, Barbara. Thank you, Barbara. Thank you. Um, Wonderful. We don't have enough time to start the next one. Marilyn, I hope that's Sorry, all right. Yeah. I hope next week is okay. You're on mute. You're on mute. Marilyn. There you Sorry. go. Sorry. Uh, let me check my schedule just real quick. I don't think I have to. I don't know if I have to work next week or not. That's always a, an issue when I, uh, you know, when I, um, on Wednesdays, if I have to, to sit with my lady. Right. Uh, mm. 
March 23rd. Yeah, I'm supposed to work. Okay, well uh, then, who has Ephesians? Do you remember? I don't have the list in front of me. Uh, I Laura? I can, I can is, tell you. Uh, uh, you're on mute, Laura. Can you do Ephesians next week? Sure. Okay. Sure, I'll do it. Oh. That's, what, that's what we'll do. All right. Okay. Um, I can do it on. I can do it on the uh, the thirtieth. I'm open. That's, on that's fine. That's so. fine. I'm going to stop the recording. Excuse me.